is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. Chapters 7, 8, and 9. Matthias, Jesper, and Kaz. In these chapters, heist, 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 heist. I'm so excited that we're planning a heist. I know that's like what this has all been building to. Like it, I knew this earlier, but when everybody gets in the room and plans together, that's when it's official. Welcome to Spoil Me. Right, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Natasha. Um, this episode is brought to you by Megan Tolentino. Thank you very much, Megan, for getting this episode and uh, allowing me to read the next three chapters. It's been about an even three chapters almost every 50 pages. So that's working out quite nicely. Um, and yeah, these three chapters, I noticed there is no Inej. Um, and we get a new perspective, actually we get Jesper um, for the first time. And I have been combo reading and listening to the audiobook and was uh, pleasantly surprised by how much I liked Jesper's narrator because each character's POV has a different narrator. Um, And Jesper, this is actually going to sound like an insult, but I don't mean it that way. But Jesper sounds very much like the uh, Dean from the opposing community college on community city college. Um, He sounds, I think it's the way that he really enunciates things, but I had trouble like keeping a straight face a couple of times because there were particular turns of phrase where it really stood out to me. So these chapters, the first one that we get um, is Matthias, Matthias. She calls her, she calls him Matthias, I think in the, uh, the audiobook, but I like Matthias, like that's just what I'm gonna go with. So um and I had hoped that once we got to his POV that we would actually find out what it was that Nina did to him, but no such luck actually. Um there is just a lot of sort of vague he he alludes to her doing some shady shit and ruining his life and that he really regrets like getting involved with her, but there's not a uh, distinctive story here. The only thing that really locks any of it down is what Kaz uses later to convince him to join in the heist, which is that she will withdraw her testimony and she will go to prison for perjury for a couple of months. And, you know, so that's all we've got. And, it, you know, it's one of those things that, like, is she, did she lie to send him to prison? Or did she just tell the truth when she was supposed to keep her mouth shut? Um, and she's willing to say that she lied, even though she didn't, in order to get him off the hook. Like, there's a couple possibilities here. Um, and if she was supposed to keep her mouth shut and didn't. I'm very curious why. I want to know what was in it for her. And he really seems to blame her in this particular sort of way that feels like he thinks she's very vindictive and did this all to ruin his life on purpose. Like that she doesn't actually care about him. And as far as he's concerned, everything that was between them was a huge act on her part. We've been inside her head. So we know that this is not strictly true. But we also know that Nina is somewhat duplicitous, um, a really good liar, really good actress, and that she has the ability to mess with people's moods, which I'm sure can like manipulate them in a whole other slew of ways. So, you know, it's, it's a, a bummer to read how sure he is that he was just some like sad little pawn who got duped when we know that she actually really cares about him, but there's no way that he believes her. And I was actually really surprised by the fact that she accepts his anger because I, I sort of, 
I guess when she is saving him in chapter six and trying to get him to wake up and he comes after her and like starts to strangle her, I think I expected her to be like, what's the matter with you? How could you think I would really do that to you on purpose? It was just a big misunderstanding. But that is not what happens. She just sort of gets him off her and they like calm him down and convince him to go. But it's not a surprise to her. So when I had read her like internal monologue saying, I am the one who sent him to prison, he's here and it's all my fault. I was really giving her the benefit of the doubt that she was blaming herself for something that really wasn't really her fault. That maybe like she messed up in some way, but overall it was, she was just one piece in the many pieces that sent him here. Now I am reevaluating that stance because he seems so convinced that she is 100% responsible. And she seems completely willing to take that responsibility. Plus her agree agreeing to withdraw her testimony. This is all pointing in the direction of yeah, this bitch lied. This bitch did some shit that was seriously messed up. And um, I'm just really curious because, like I said, I've been trying to give Nina the benefit of the doubt a little bit when we were inside of her head. We really got a a, 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 like, small impression of her that felt like, okay, she's a, um, she's a little bit, what's the word, high maintenance in some ways and argumentative, but it doesn't seem like she's a bad person. And now I'm like, well, you know, people do shitty things even when they're bad, not bad people. So maybe this is just an instance or maybe she, like, had her feet held to the fire and, Maybe he doesn't know that. There's a lot of theorizing going on in my head. But like I said, I have no actual idea of what happened. So it's all vague notions and uh, trying to guess based on what I know of their characters, which is really, admittedly at this point, very little. Um, And the next, uh, like when, when he, because we start off with him that he thinks he's dreaming because he dreams about her all the time. And I really like the way that this is done. Um, Always he chased, always he caught her. In the good dreams, he slammed her to the ground and throttled her, watching the life drain from her eyes, heart full of vengeance. Finally, finally. In the bad dreams, he kissed her. In these dreams, she didn't fight him. She laughed as if the chase was nothing but a game, as if she'd known he would catch her, as if she'd wanted him to, and there was no place she'd rather be than beneath him. She was welcoming and perfect in his arms. He kissed her, buried his face in the sweet hollow of her neck. Her curls brushed his cheeks, and he felt that if he could just hold her a little longer, every wound, every hurt, every bad thing would melt away. Matthias, she would whisper, her name so, his name so soft on her lips. These were the worst dreams, and when he woke, he hated himself almost as much as he hated her. To know that he could betray himself, betray his country again, even in sleep. To know that after everything she'd done, some sick part of him still hungered after her. It was too much. Oh, shit. Betray his country again. What did he do, though? Um... And it goes, tonight was a bad dream. Very bad. She was wearing blue silk. And, you know, all of this is like this description of her. And we know that this is actually happening. Um, Oh, Saints Matthias, she whispered, please wake up. And then he was awake and he knew he'd gone mad because she was here in his cell, kneeling beside him, her hand resting gently on his chest. Uh, Matthias, please. The sound of her voice pleading with him. He dreamed of this. Sometimes she pleaded for mercy. Sometimes... There were other things she begged for. Oh, shit. He talking about his dick. Oh. Um, So, yeah, this whole thing is really, like, loaded. And it's... I really like seeing their perspectives of their relationship from each of their points of view. right One right after the other. It just gives a strong impression of... Not only like, you know, I I do like the unreliable narrator thing, but it also tells you who they are and the way they think, you know. Um, So 
then when he finally completely wakes up, he sees that there are tears in his eyes. And he's so disgusted because she has no right to tears or pity. And he just goes after her and starts to strangle her. He thinks that maybe when she says we're here to get you out, that she's just fucking with him, which is a real hell of a thing to think. Like, again, what did she do to him that he would think she would mess with him in that kind of way? That's a serious, like, yikes. Um, he re- he also is, like, thinking about the fact that they made him murder wolves and how later on he's just really thinking, like, that was it. That that was when he turned the corner. Like, and he there's no coming back from what they've turned him into at this point. So he's in the middle of strangling her and behind him, somebody's got a gun pressed against the back of his neck. Um, and I love this traitor, witch, abomination. All those words came to him, but others crowded in too. Beautiful, charmed one, Roed Fetla, he'd called her, little red bird for the color of her Grisha order, the color she loved. He squeezed harder, silencing that weak-willed strain inside him. And uh, he's still trying to strangle her when Kaz smacks him on the shoulder in just such a way that his whole arm goes numb. I really enjoy this. Like, we've seen Kaz be very protective of his cane in the past, but... I didn't really know how precise he could be with it. And being able to just make somebody's arm go numb, like, that's not nothing. That's a pretty good little weapon to have. Um, So he and, and then and then, guys, the description of Kaz, a boy wearing a guard's uniform stood before him, dark eyes glittering, pistol in one hand, walking stick in the other. Its handle was carved to look like a crow's head with a cruelly pointed beak. He calls him a boy, which again, I can't stop thinking of Kaz in my head as being a full grown grizzled man. I know he's not. The book keeps telling me that, but I just, that's what I keep picturing. You know, I keep honestly, part of it too, is that his name is Kaz and it keeps reminding me of the dude who plays Gaz in Full Monty who also plays Rumpelstiltskin on the uh, Once Upon a Time. And I just, like, can't get the image of him out of my mind because he's also, like, he always tends to play ne'er do wells, right? Um, So I feel like that would really suit if only the age weren't completely off. So he starts to argue about the entire plan of getting him out of here. Um... And this is the moment when everybody starts screaming. And I didn't think about this, like, as a possibility. But it turns out that they open the cages of all the animals that the inmates are being made to fight against. So they hear the roaring of a great cat, the trumping, the trumpet of an elephant. Oh, my God. This is just, that's a lot. Damn. Is that like they, they, so this is causing a mass exodus by all of the people who are dressed up. So they can just like kind of number one, blend in with part of the crowd, but also number two, everybody will be so distracted that they're, they'll be able to sneak out via a different route than the way they came in. Um, so, and he says, Jesper was supposed to wait until three bells. It is three bells, Kaz, replied a small girl in the corner with dark hair and deep bronze Suli skin. A figure covered in welts and bandages was leaning against her. Um, so he tries to get Matthias up. See what I'm saying? Matthias, sorry. Um, and he's still kind of certain at this point that this is all a dream and he decides that you know what even if it is a dream i'm gonna just gonna go with like what are they gonna do to me if they catch me i'm already in hell they already made me kill wolves i'm just gonna go for it and i love that he starts to jump in with all of the regular people 
And Kaz has to stop him and says, boys like you weren't meant to get ideas, Helvar. The staircase leads to a bottleneck. You think the guards won't check under that mask before they let you through? And I like that. He, boys like you weren't meant to get ideas. Yeah, I. from what I'm, I'm seeing of Helvar, I think that's fair. He's the muscle. He's not the guy that you go to for a cogent plan that has been well thought out and that the details have been hammered out on. Uh, so then, then comes the moment where he really starts to like, understand what he's up against in terms of if he tries to fight these folks, um, the desert lizard came pounding towards them, its mouth dripping foaming white poison, its fat tail lashing the ground. Before Matthias could could think to move, the bronze girl had vaulted over its back and dispatched the creature with two bright daggers wedged beneath the armor of its scales. The lizard groaned and collapsed on its side. Matthias felt a pang of sadness. It was a grotesque creature, and he'd never seen a, fi a fighter survive its attack, but it was also a living thing. You've never seen a fighter survive until now, he corrected himself. The bronze girl's daggers merit watching. Yeah, not just her daggers, but he doesn't really like pick up on that soon enough. Um, so they head out through uh, this these uh, like back hallways. And I love that as they race past the open doors, he glimpsed a pair of yellow eyes glaring at him from the shadows. And then he was moving on. He cursed his deadened arm and lack of weapon. He was virtually defenseless. Where is this Kaz leading us? They wended past a wild boar feeding on a guard and spotted a cat that hissed and spit at them, but did not draw near. I really enjoy that there's this like really daring escape happening. And there's also a panic with a bunch of, of people like in finery trying to cram themselves all through the front door. And there are these fucking animals loose that they have to run by. Like this is some sort of ride, like carnival ride. I don't, this just felt very, uh, it was a lot of imagery and it was really fun. So I love the, uh, they get to the front. You were early. Jesper has said I was on time for you. That's early. Next time you plan to impress me, give me some warning. Um, so they are getting into the boat and this is the part where fucking, uh, Halvar, Halvar is thinking about how he's going to escape from these guys. Again, not the smartest guy. Like, dude, this is not, if you want to escape these people, this isn't when you do it. You wait until they've gotten you off of the island with the prison and then you escape from them. Give them the slip on the docks or something. Um, unhook the rope, disable Jesper. He'd have a gun and possession of the boat. And Nina can stop your heart before you've taken hold of the oars, so shoot her first. Put a bullet in her heart. Stay long enough to watch her fall and then be done with this place. He could do it. He knew he could. All he needed was a distraction. The bronze girl was standing just to his right. Even injured, he could knock her into the water without losing his footing or doing her any real harm. Drop the girl. Free the boat. Disable the shooter. Kill Nina. Kill Nina. Kill Nina. He took a deep breath and threw his weight at the bronze girl. She stepped aside as if she'd known he was coming, languidly hooking her heel behind his ankle. Matthias let out a grunt as he landed hard on the stones. Ah, oh, I love this so much. I just love how casual she is about it. Like, yeah, dummy. <sighs> do I have to do this? Don't make me. I didn't want to. You made me. And Nina starts to come like forward and... He scrambled backward, nearly landing himself in the water. If she laid hands on him again, he'd lose his mind. Nina halted, the hurt on her face unmistakable. She had no right. And finally, she puts his hand, she puts his, her hands on him and sends him to sleep. And he muddled, mumber, do you hear me? I can't read and talk apparently. And he mutters to himself, kill you before he just passes out, which is really humiliating, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the escape. And once they, once he opens his eyes, um, there, I think they're often in the uh, crow club, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
And I, this is something that I think a lot of specifically women will be able to relate to. Um, Matthias knew monsters, and one glance at Kaz Brecker told him this was a creature who had spent too long in the dark. He'd brought something back with him when he'd crawled into the light. Matthias could sense it around him. He knew others laughed at Fjerdin's superstition, but he trusted his gut. Or he had, until Nina. That had been one of the worst effects of her betrayal, the way he'd been forced to second-guess himself. That doubt had almost been his undoing at Hellgate, where instinct had been everything. There is something so real about that sentence. The fact, like, when somebody harms you, and it's somebody that you trusted, it unravels so much of who you are, because you organize who you are, in large part, around how you trust people, who you trust, the ways in which you show that, and what it means to you that you can trust somebody. Are you somebody that that's not a big deal for? Or are you somebody that has a really hard time opening up and trusting people? And that when when that starts to come undone and you no longer know who to trust, whether to trust your gut instinct on, you know, what somebody's intentions are, it just really can shatter your worldview. And when I said that women specifically could relate to this, this is something that happens a lot when you are, especially when you're younger. And by younger, I mean like 21 and younger, when you're just starting to become noticed um, and you are drawing the attention of men oftentimes and yet you are not experienced enough to recognize it for what it is. And so there will be a lot of men in your life that you trust and begin, begin to realize maybe you should not because they start to do things or say things that indicate what you thought your relationship was with them is not how they see it. And they will do things that you never thought they'd be capable of. And I say this, they will, and women do, because I have never talked to a single solitary woman in my entire life that didn't relate to this storyline of realizing at a certain age, I just can't trust men most of the time. Like, I have to be on my guard always. And it really makes you second guess everything. And it makes you second guess even like your own responses to things because you're responding in like an instinctual way usually when you have conversations, but then you'll start to be like, should I have said that? Are they going to take it the wrong way? And it just transforms the way that you interact with the world. And that's why so many women start to clam up and not speak at all and not take action at all because they've learned that they can be punished for that, even though they're doing a lot of what they do in self-defense. So this whole thing about like not trusting your your gut about things and having you know not having the sort of trust in in yourself the way that you did that is something that a lot of women um who have experienced assault specifically will say that like it just they almost wonder sometimes did i imagine this or did I create like turn this into a bigger deal than it really was, especially if it's somebody that you knew and that person that you knew is behaving as if it's not a big deal. Then you start to again, just be like, maybe I'm misunderstanding what that whole thing was. So yeah, that like line from Matthias really got to me in this specific way that made me feel like I understood him a little bit more. Um, Although again, I still don't know what she did. Um. So he's watching um, Kaz and he's fucking tied to a chair and they are all standing around him just kind of like with some trepidation because this dude apparently is pretty key to their plan, but also that he is not cooperative. So if they if he decides that he's not going to go with them, there isn't a lot of time for them to find a backup plan. So they were, they're all pretty intent on convincing him here. Um, so Brecker started talking about a drug called Jurta Parem, about an impossibly high reward, about the absurd idea of attempting a raid on the ice court. When Brecker finally finished, Matthias simply said, no, 
Believe me when I say this, Helvar, I know getting knocked out and waking up in strange surroundings isn't the friendliest way to start a partnership, but you didn't give us many options, so try to open your mind to the possibilities. You could have come to me on your knees, and my answer would still be the same. You do understand I can have you back at Hellgate in a matter of hours? Once poor Muzzin is in the infirmary, the switch will be easy. Do it. I can't wait to tell the warden your ridiculous plans. What makes you think you'll be going back with a tongue? Kaz, Nina protested. Do what you want, Matthias said. He wouldn't betray his country again. I told you, said Nina. Don't pretend to know me, witch, he snarled, his eyes trained on Brecker. He wouldn't look at her. He refused to. So, yeah, this whole thing, without him, there's no job, said Jesper. We can't break into the ice court blind. So, you know, at this point, first read through, we don't even know what they want him for. But it turns out that he has some inside knowledge of what the ice court is like, what the building is like, and how they are going to be able to get inside. Um... It was a compound, Fierda's ancient stronghold, home to an unbroken succession of kings and queens, repository of their greatest treasures and most sacred religious relics. It was impenetrable. So, finally, they present him with the idea of, first, they, you know, they try and do the money. That does not work on him. He could give a shit. Um, and then... I'll, he says that he will do it for the exchange of being able to kill Nina, which is hysterical. Like, I don't want to be as contemptuous of this as I am, because like I said, obviously, she fucked him up in some way that seems very real to him. But it is so funny to me that he thinks that he's going to be able to, like, make this happen. Does, does he really think that? I guess he doesn't. Um and I love Kaz, however, didn't seem surprised. If anything, he looked pleased. Matthias had, uh, Matthias had the uncomfortable sense that the demon had known exactly how this would play out. And he tells him, I can make you Druskel again. And in light of new evidence, Matthias Benedict Helvar is granted full and immediate pardon for all charges of slave trafficking. Mm. Did he, did she lie and say he stole her? Mm. He is released on this day with the apologies of the court and will be provided transport to his homeland or a destination of his choosing with all possible haste and the sincere apologies of the court and the Kirch government. What new evidence? It seems Nina Zenik has recanted her statements. She will face charges of perjury. And he looks over at her finally. He had been refusing to look at her. And when he does, he can see that there's bruises on her throat and tries to be like, glad that he did that but you can tell he's not that's one of my favorite things about matthias's character is how often he's like i should think this i do think that do you clearly does not um and when they say two months for nina going to prison for perjury he is straight up cracking up over it because not only is two months nothing compared to where he like how long he had been apparently sent away but she's so easy, like, she's so good at manipulating people that she could have the coziest time um, and manipulate people into helping her and making everything more comfortable for her for the two months that she's in there. So I kind of get that. I really like when he started to point that out, I was like, oh, yeah, that's true. Um Nina would serve her time and return to Ravka four million Kruger richer, never giving him another thought. But if this pardon was real, then he could go home too. And then comes like he's thinking to himself about the longing to go home and hear his language spoken, to see his friends, to eat the foods that he loves, to like see just all of the the way that this is written it really was touching, actually. Like, I, I believed that he had a home somewhere. I believed that there was a whole other world that we haven't seen yet, and that it meant something to him. Um, so, yeah, this moment, finally. What if Bol, Bol, Bol Yul Bayur is dead? Van Eck insists he isn't. 
And, but what if he is? You still get your pardon. Even if their quarry was already on his way to the afterlife, Matthias would have his freedom. At what cost, though? He'd made mistakes before. He'd been foolish enough to trust Nina. He'd been weak, and he would carry that shame for the rest of his life. But he'd paid for his stupidity and blood and misery in the stink of Hellgate, and his crimes had been meager things, the actions of a naive boy. This was so much worse. To reveal the secrets of the ice court, to see his homeland once more, only to know that every step he took there was an act of treason. Could he do such a thing? Um, but... He finally, like, comes to terms with the fact that Matthias organized this whole breakout, and it went seamlessly. Matthias has a pardon in his hand right now. Obviously, this guy knows what he's doing and is able to get some shit done that I don't really understand. And he figures that he could join with, uh, with Kaz, get the pardon, go home, become a Driscoll, and then turn around and hunt down Nina, which, you know, not a bad plan. If you're deciding that you're just going to be like very one track about tracking her down, why not? That seems very reasonable to me. Um, and he says that he would like he says that he would do all this stuff to her and starve her and whatever. Um, he'd toy with her as she'd toyed with him. He'd offer her salvation and then deny it. He'd gift her with affec affection and small kindnesses and then snatch them away. Yeah, that's, uh, all very specific. I just really, I'm dying to know how valid this all is. Like, does he believe this because he doesn't have all the information and this is genuinely what it looked like to him? Or does he believe this because he's just got a skewed perspective and completely misinterprets most things because there are definitely characters like that. So I'm curious to find out. Um, so Inej comes forward and slices up his uh, bonds so that he's free again. And Kaz does all of the introductions. Jesper Fahey is our sharpshooter. Zemini born, but try not to hold him against, hold it against him. And this is Wyland, best demolitions expert in the barrel. Rask is better, Inej said. The boy looked up, ruddy gold hair flopping in his eyes and spoke for the first time. He's not better, he's reckless. He knows his trade. So do I. Barely, Jesper said. Wylan is new to the scene, admitted Brecker. Of course he's new, he looks like he's about twelve, retorted Matthias. I'm sixteen, said Wylan sullenly. Matthias doubted that, fifteen at most. So this is the first time that we uh, that we get a sense of what's going on with Wyland, which we find out shortly. Um, we should be using Rask, Jesper said. He's good under pressure. I don't like it, agreed Inej. I didn't ask, said Kaz. Besides, Wyland isn't just good with the flint and fuss. He's our insurance. Against what? asked Nina. Meet Wyland Van Eck. Jan Van Eck's son and our guarantee on 30 million Kruger. Oh, man. So then we jump to Jesper's point of view. And Jesper is cracking up because obviously, obviously, Kaz had some shit up his sleeve with Wyland. Like, they were all just baffled by the fact that he trusted this kid, was making so much of him and telling everybody how great he was when he has not proven himself and that's not usually how things go. And... The fact that Wylan realizes that he's not here because he's so good. He's here because he's a hostage. That's a fucked up position to be in. I would be so humiliated. Oh, my God. To think like, oh, I've I've made the grade and, and the almighty Kaz, who everybody's afraid of, thinks that I'm the best and he chose me for the super secret mission. And it turns out that he is just a pawn. And... Maybe it turns out that he is good at demo. He says, passable. Um, you're passable at demo. You're excellent at hostage. That was cruel, but that was Kaz. And the barrel was a far rougher teacher than Kaz could ever be. At least this explained why Kaz had been coddling Wylan and sending jobs his way. So this, I just found this delightful. Like, what a lovely little twist. It's great. Um, and... There's a whole, 
um, we should still take Rask and leave this baby merch on lockdown in Ketterdam, says Jesper. Um, Wyland doesn't know enough people to cause us real trouble. Don't I have some say in this, complained Wyland? I'm sitting right here. Ever had your pocket picked, Wyland? Been mugged in an alley? Hung over the side of a bridge with your head in the canal? Beaten until you can't walk? No. Why do you think that is? It's been three months since you left your daddy's mansion at the Geldstraat. Why do you suppose your sergeant in the barrel has been so blessed? Lucky, I guess, Wyland suggested weakly. Oh, man. It's just, it's a good moment. Um, so, Wyland has to then keep insisting that he's not useless, that he's not just a hostage, and says that he went to an embassy dinner with his father at the ice court, and so he has a general idea. And I'm wondering, like, you know, as a kid as young as he is, does he need to be paying attention? Like, is he somebody who paid attention and would be able to pull up memory of this place just from uh, a dinner that he went to once years ago, maybe? Um yeah, I'm just curious about if he actually is going to be that useful. But <laughs> Jesper noted the way Matthias's shoulders hunched every time Nina talked. He didn't know what history they were chewing on, but they'd probably kill each other before they ever got to Fierda. So Jesper has a kind of, um, I don't know, a, a good naturedness about his personality or his point of views. Um, that's also got like a snark edge to it. And I'm not really, I don't think I've seen Jesper in action enough to know if he like deserves to have a, the bit of arrogance that he seems to, but all right. A nib for every occasion. Start talking. Kaz said to the fjord and it's time to pay the rent. Matthias directed his furious gaze at Kaz. Definitely a mighty glower. It was almost fun to watch him pit it against Kaz's shark-like stare. Shark-like. So he tells them that the whole thing is built on a rise, so it's sort of like a giant cake, and that the cliffs are unscalable and the northern road is the only way in or out. And you have to go through a guarded checkpoint before you even reach the ring wall. Um, two checkpoints, said Wylam. When I was there, there were two. So then he says that there are two checkpoints because it's harder to bribe two guards. And the thing is set up in like concentric circles with its own uh, ring wall so that it looks like the rings on a tree. Um, the schedule changes each week and the guards are only given their postings the night before. And there are always at least four guards on duty, even when the gate isn't in use. Kaz here says, I think we can handle four guards. And Matthias says, the gates weigh thousands of pounds and can only be operated from within the guardhouses. And even if you could raise one of them, opening a gate that isn't scheduled for use would trigger black protocol. The entire court would go on lockdown and you'd give away your location. A ripple of unease passed through the room. Jesper shifted uncomfortably. If the expressions on the others' faces were any indication, they were all having the same thought. Just what are we getting into? Only Kaz seemed unfazed. Put it all down, Kaz said, tapping the paper. Helvire, I expect you to describe the mechanics of the alarm system to Wyland later. Um, I don't really know how it works. It's some kind of series of cables and bells. Well, where will they be keeping Boyul Bayur? Um, and he identifies an area, probably here, the prison sector. It's where they keep the most dangerous criminals. Assassins, terrorists. Grisha? Nina asked. Exactly, he replied grimly. You guys are going to make this really fun, aren't you? Asked Jesper. Usually people don't start hating each other until the week into the job, but you two have a head start. They cast him twin glares and Jesper beamed back at them. Oh, Jesper. I kind of love him, I have to admit. Um, So... The buildings on the outer circle surround the ice moat. And at the moat's center is the White Island, where the treasury and the royal palace are. It's the most secure place in the ice court. Then that's where Bolyu Bayur will be, said Kaz. Matthias smiled. Actually, it was less a smile than a baring of teeth. 
Then your quest is pointless, Matthias said. There is no way a group of foreigners is going to make it to the White Island. Don't look so pleased, Helvar. We don't get inside. You don't get your pardon. And he's just like, listen, whatever, but I can't make something happen that is impossible. And the um, Nina says, Hringskala is coming. Be silent, Matthias snapped at her. Pray don't, said Kaz. Hringskala is the day of listening when the new Driskill are initiated on the White Island. Matthias's knuckles flexed white. You have no right to speak of those things. They're holy. Oh, Matthias and uh, Inej have a little something in common with their being uptight about religious slash spiritual shit. Maybe they'll team up. Um, so, yeah, this whole thing is a perfect opportunity, but it's also like kind of unconscionable in Matthias's eyes that she would suggest this as the opportunity for their attack. Um, so they are deciding that they're going to use that as their sort of distraction. Um, visitors are vetted weeks before they arrive at the ice court. Matthias said, anyone entering the embassy will have their papers checked and checked again. Fjerdens aren't fools. Nina raised a brow. Not all of them, at least. Don't poke the bear, Nina, Kaz said. <laughs> Oh, God, I just the, the way like, I just really enjoy this going back and forth with the two of them, just how irritating it must be to everybody in the room who doesn't actually know what's going on. Um, that's also some of the thing for me, like if I were watching this interaction, it's helpful for me to know whose side to be on. So the fact that they're like going back and forth like this, but I'm not actually sure who I should be rooting for would be very frustrating to me. Um. Oh, my God. And then there's that moment. We're not going through the embassy, said Kaz. Always hit where the mark isn't looking. Who's Mark? asked Wyland. Oh, God. Bless him. Bless him. And Jesper then starts making fun of him and is like, well, I'm sure that you know all kinds of stuff we don't, like how to dance the minuet and play the flute. Oh, God. So... Kaz says, well, we know what the easiest way is to steal a man's wallet. And it's so I love the how telling their responses are. Knife to the throat, asked Inej. Gun to the back, said Jesper. Poison in his cup, suggested Nina. You're all horrible, said Matthias. Kaz rolled his eyes. The easiest way to steal a man's wallet is to tell him you're going to steal his watch. You take his attention and direct it where you want it to go. Hringskala is going to do that job for us. The ice court will have to divert resources to monitoring guests and protecting the royal family. They can't be looking everywhere at once. It's the perfect opportunity to bring Bo Yule Bayur. Um, at the prison, they won't care about who's coming in, just anyone trying to get out. At the embassy, they won't care who's going out. They'll just be focused on who's trying to get in. We enter through the prison, leave through the embassy. So that's a pretty smart idea. I mean, I got to give Kaz credit on this one. And uh, yeah, there's this like back and forth about the alarms and how all of that is going to work. Um, and there's a possibility that they get put in prison under like false names that they pretend to be prisoners and then break out. Um which is a very interesting idea. I'm not super confident that's going to go real well, but I guess we'll see. Um, and then there's the question of, will Yul Bayor come willingly? Inej asks, which honestly, that didn't even occur to me that like maybe Yul Bayor doesn't want to leave. And that's a really good question to be asking that I really took for granted what because I'm assuming that he's being really mistreated and that escaping is going to be like number one on his list, but evidently there's a possibility that he's being treated really well and not interested in going off with a bunch of randos. Um, and I mean, especially if he's being treated, even even if he's not being treated super well, if he's at all worried that they may eventually kill him, at least getting out of there would ensure that he could potentially break away from these folks. 
Um, but then there's the idea maybe he's being treated well and he thinks that these folks aim to bring him somewhere else to be killed. So, yeah, it could kind of go either way. I don't know anything about his situation. Um, so it really does look like the rings of a tree, she said, r- running her finger over the rough sketch Wyland had produced. No, said Kaz. It looks like a target. So they're going to sail by tomorrow night and Kaz is going to get a ship. Um, and he's, you know, figuring that there might be some bad weather. And so they want to get a he- like a start as early as they possibly can. Because if they risk this big uh, ring scala, this big event, then that's kind of their best shot out the window. So they need to ensure that they get there in time. Um, I don't know if I just if I said that we transition to Kaz's POV right here, but we do. So yeah, this um, then we have Jesper, who is uh, <laughs> he's told to watch Wylan, and then when Kaz gives uh, the money to Jesper for buying the ship, I think it is. Then he tells Wyland to keep an eye on Jesper because Jesper has a gambling problem. So then Jesper, I don't need a nursemaid. Oh, uh, yeah. It's really uh, kind of fun how Jesper like loves to make fun of Wyland, but then immediately kind of gets like snapped back a little bit. I really like Jesper, to be honest. So... Um, if this works the way I think it will, we're going to have to enter the ice court empty handed. He saw a shadow pass over Inez's face. She wouldn't like being without her knives any more than he liked being without his cane. I'll need you to go get cold weather gear and because they're going to approach from the north. Um, and (laughs) this, I bet they'll be tightening security during your big party. It isn't a party. It sounds like a party, said Jesper. It isn't supposed to be a party, Helvar amended sullenly. Oh, I just, he's so cranky. Oh, he's so funny. It isn't supposed to be a party. So then Nina says, well, what are we going to do with him? Her voice was disinterested, but the performance was wasted on everyone except Helvar. They'd all seen her tears at Hellgate. I like that on everyone except Helvar. So he's still sitting there thinking that she doesn't care. And everyone else knows that she cares so much. Like a la a la a la. Um, so then we go, we have the, um, all right. <laughs> You're leaving Helvar unshackled. Can you behave? Kaz asked the Fjordan. His eyes looked murder, but he nodded. So then we have the moment where uh, fucking Matthias attacks Kaz after everybody's been gone. Um, and Kaz lets it happen. He'd been expecting this. Matthias clamped one filthy hand over Kaz's mouth. Now here's an interesting thing. The sensation of skin on skin set off a riot of revulsion in Kaz's head. But because he'd been anticipating the attack, he managed to control the sickness that overcame him. Matthias's other hand rooted around in Kaz's coat pockets, first one, then the other. Ferris, he grunted angrily in Fjordan. Then, where is it? in Kirch. Kaz gave Helvar another moment of frenzied searching, then dropped his elbow and jabbed upward, forcing Helvar to loosen his grip. Kaz slipped away easily. He smacked Helvar behind the right leg with his cane, and the big Fjordan collapsed. When he tried to shove up again, Kaz kicked him. Stay down, you pathetic skiv. Again, Helvar tried to rise. He was fast, and prison had made him strong. Kaz cracked him hard on the jaw, then gave the pressure points at Helvar's huge shoulders two lightning-quick jabs with the tip of his cane. The Fjordan grunted as his arms went limp and useless at his sides. Move again, and I'll smash your jaw so badly you'll be drinking your meals for the rest of your life. Oh, man, this is such a good moment. It's so satisfying because he really thinks that he's just going to be able to reach in there and grab the pardon and that Kaz won't have had like a backup or. Yeah. Kaz made the the pardon vanish in thin air. He had produced it from a pocket that had seemed empty just a moment before. And Helvar calls him a demon. And Kaz, in his mind, is just like, yeah, no. He's just, I just learned how to do this. Um, 
because I practiced in front of a mirror after learning sleight of hand from Card Sharps and Monty Runners on East Stave. So, yeah. I love this. Like, his line here, Hellgate would have been paradise to me as a child. You move like an ox. You'd last about two days on the streets where I grew up. This was your one free pass, Helvar. Don't test me again. Nod so I know you understand. Sometimes the big ones didn't know when to stay down. Oh, snap. So, yeah, guys, this whole setup. So good. I'm really excited about it. Um, I just I'm dying to know what the fucking what the actual plan is going to entail, because we get a lot of like teasing and a lot of, oh, well, we'll probably have to do this. And some people disagreeing. And so and of course, you know, like in something like this, things don't go to plan. Usually Um, there's there's often some sort of like weird problem that they have to adjust all of their plans. And it's like this panicked moment. So, yeah, I'm going to be really curious how this all goes down. And I'm also just, is there anybody who's going to tip off that they're coming? Like, I'm trying to think if there's anybody who knows about uh, Van X, like his, his deal with the other merchers. And is there any potential for the ice court to be prepared for their arrival, maybe not on the like, you know, exact day that they plan to do this. But are they going to be aware somebody's trying? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing here. Um, But yeah, so again, thank you to Megan Tolentino for commissioning this episode. I don't know um, when the next one will be for this one. I don't think it's been booked yet. But I'm very much looking forward to reading further here. And there's not that much left to go of this, actually. Like, when I looked, I wish that... um, Oh, no, there is actually quite a bit to go. Because they're all... The chapter um, table of contents is collapsed on my thing. But it really frustrates me that, depending on what I'm using, the table of contents doesn't have page markers, like numbers on the side, for me to easily tell where to stop reading. But yeah, so I'm hoping that that was close to 50 pages. It felt like it because it usually takes roughly an hour to talk about. Um, And this is, by the way, part two, Servant and Lever, the first three chapters of part two. So I'm guessing, based on how things have gone so far, that it'll be another three chapters for the next 50 pages. And that's Inej, Jesper, Inej. Um, So yeah, hopefully somebody will come through and uh, commission that one for me. But thank you again very much to Megan. Thank you to everybody who's been listening. And um, there's nobody in the chat to ask if they want to ask me any questions. So I'm going to wrap this one up. And I will be seeing you all shortly with a new Veronica Mars. Thanks again. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.